Welcome back everyone. I am Chris Decentano and this is Melanie Thorley. We are both solicitors here at MJT Law and we're back for another week of the law cast and we, we both have something to speak about. Uh, so why don't you kick us off? Okay, it's my team to go first today. I want to talk about the gig economy. Oh, the new and emerging area. Oh, I really like it because I really like the space where we've got something that's not quite employment, not quite contractor. Mm. We've got the government getting all the knickers in a twist about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's certainly something that we've both, re and, many, and many practitioners are probably the same, where uh, we've got a situation where it's becoming quite prevalent, uh, whether it be kind of as a side hustle or many hustles all at once. Yes. Yes. Um, yep. You signed up to Uber. You signed up to dog walking. You signed up to did, caring. Did you, yeah, and we're really talking about kind of complete economic and, and employment freedom yeah, here. Yeah. Um, but the current regime doesn't really fit. No. It. Not, not no. In, in a way that makes which a lot is, of sense. Which is really weird because we've had Uber Eats what a decade now. It's been a while. So <laughs> why have we been so slow? So for those who don't know, um, the gig economy is a task based work made available through online platforms. We probably, all of us, have used them, um, whether it be ordering Uber Eats or ordering Uber mm. or, I don't know, anyone, you know, getting a carer in, get the dog walker. I mean, there's... It, People get them as tutors for their kids. Oh, yeah, They're getting the, endless. you know, your, yeah. your dog walker. It might be uh, your cleaner might be doing it. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think also there's this kind of incidental side hustle thing where people who perhaps have an emerging business mm -hmm. um, in their downtime, they're off trying to earn a bit of a living. And this was really popular when Uber first so started. It was almost their, their kind of entire premise, this I idea so. about basically making an extra dollar. Yeah, the, start your business, you've got some free time, go out and do some Uber. And in fact... I don't know about uh, our watchers and listeners, but I've jumped into an Uber and they've said that they've got a different job, handed me their business card, and, yeah, yeah. and, and got on with it. So yeah. I, I, I really like this gig economy, but it's this concept where I think the government, when I say the government, I mean you know the people who are regulating employment or the organisations that are regulating employment really struggle with the space. Mm, I mean, the mm. unions must struggle with it like yep. crazy. Yep. Uh, we've got employers who are probably struggling with it because of the side hustle issue. Yep. And we've got the ATO struggling with it because they're not getting their cut. Yeah, probably. <laughs> not, not, not the whole thing, I imagine. Yeah, and uh, I think... Um, I think... I, I the, the one thing I saw, and I was looking at the news today about gig economies, is globally it's worth... 5.4 trillion dollars. Mm. Mm. 5.4 trillion dollars. So it's making a very, quite a, a big this chunk is... of, of economic activity. Oh, um, I, I just look at that and that's a staggering. It's a staggering amount. And this is just revenue in US dollars during 2021. Mm. Mm. So, in fact, here in Australia, it would be 10. No, it would be less than that. 7 trillion dollars. Mm. globally and it's just I just think that's a staggering number so if it's worth that much then everyone's at it or almost everyone's at it yeah um you know I, I and I'm not please don't quote me on this but you know I have seen kind of stats being thrown around that it's you know it's 25 30 percent of the like the working population mm. have been some form or another in the last five years um and but they are proposing some changes, I believe. They are. The, they are massive. To try and kind of capture it a little bit better. Well, yeah, I think it's. I think it's a do kind of a little bit of everything. Um, we we know over the last decade or so uh, that the law has really struggled with these gigs, and especially with Uber, who've been in and out of court in lots and lots of different yep. countries, and over and over and over and over again, they. The courts have concluded that these um, that these workers are in fact contractors, not employees. Yep. And it's only very recently we've started to see a shift in that decision, where they've gone, oh, hang on now, no, 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 I think they're employees. Yeah. But I really struggle with this concept because if you are say an Uber Eats guy, mm -hmm. and then you are a what are some of the other ones? Um, Deliveroo. Deliveroo. Uh, menu log. Yeah. And, and you're on menu log, you're on Deliveroo, and you're on Uber Eats. And what you're doing is, in any given moment in time, you are working for Uber Eats, Deliveroo, 
or menu log. Mm. And uh, in any given time, you're doing work for one of three of those. Yeah. And then in the same hour with which you're getting your paid hour, you're working for a different company. Mm. So which company is going to be paying your salary, paying your super, paying your entitlements? We're talking about a situation where you're most... It's not even on an hourly rate. No. It's, it's, it's minutes at this point. Because and it's not piece rates. And, you're, and we've been trying to get away from piece rates mm, as well. Mm. So I, I'm really fascinated as to how the gig economy and our employment structure is going to cooperate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do uh, it. It, it, it feels almost like we are putting a square piece in a circle hole. Yeah. Um, because... It feels awfully like a contracting arrangement to me. Um, this idea that flexibility. Yeah, that. control of your work. You, can, you don't, you don't work. have to say yes to that job. No. You can choose not to do it. Mm. But I think one of the problems and where it starts getting grey is when the same companies start implementing some areas of control. Um, and I know this became um, one of the issues with it. I'm going to go out of limb and say it was Uber in one of the matters was they were free to say no mm. to Kings, but they also faced, I wouldn't say it was disciplinary action, but they got less jobs. They got less jobs. The, 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 the algorithm, the algorithm of the computer. You, if you continue to, if you continue to say no to jobs, you will get less jobs. But does yeah. it, I don't understand that because if you're in the vicinity of the job, does your car just not pop up? I mean, how I does believe it, so. No, I believe it, it, the, the algorithms actually don't give um, you the options. Yeah, okay, so that's that's tough, obviously. But isn't that the ticket to play? Well... Either you are in, Uber, either you are a driver or you're not, and we see these drivers, and they are doing them all. Mm. They've got four stickers on the back of their <laughs> yeah. cars, and, and they're working the program, and mm. they may well be other type of taxi drivers in the rest of their time. Mm. So I'm just, I'm fascinated by, first of all, why should we care? Is it underpayment? Is it low bargaining power? Is it, uh, is it commercialization of a workforce? Is it, we want our taxpayers' money? We want their super? I mean, what is it? Why do we care about this? Well, I suppose it kind of comes down to your view on Your view on employment freedom as a whole, and what I mean by that is, take all your minimum standards away. Yeah, all ten of well, them. I think there's twelve of them now. But have, sorry, yes. But just everything you yeah. kind of no. And in fact, you can probably go further and, and take large ch chunks out of the Fair Work Act out, and say yes, you're in, you're in a completely <laughs> free market, and economic kind of principles may still kick in where if you had kind of freedom and if we're thinking about the gig economy we're thinking about making sure that people are paid in a way that they could still live um one would certainly argue that you can earn enough because the the demand will be people just won't drive for you and therefore if you can't if kind of drivers you also can't make any revenue as uber so your business model needs to is affected by the drivers expressing their discomfort with their cars if you're working for menu log and you have all the freedom in the world to go work for delivery and delivery is paying you a livable wage yeah or rate i suppose yeah. it'd be um then that's what you're going to do. Then that's what you're going to do. And, and there'll be more kind of, delivery for your drivers, that, more available. That kind of strikes at the heart of why we have any of the... Why have any... If, if that's your kind of point of view, then why have any of the minimum But standards? also, I still don't see why we care. It's not like these... It's not like the gig economy are somehow walking around with their eyes shut. We're talking mm. about people who are not 12 years old. They often are sophisticated employees mm. or contractors mm. or not at all either and or they've quit their jobs and retired to do this in their spare time I mean mm. there's lots of reasons why people do this um, it could be that they are um, 
international workers and you know this is a this is obviously an issue for you know government mm. departments but they are making money without having to declare the time that they're doing that and a lot of um international students have limited hours mm. and they're filling those limited hours with other things and doing this on the slide the side hustle essentially so are we caring because actually the rest of us can't get away with it or are we caring because Actually, these these people don't make a living, and somehow they get caught in poverty, which I don't necessarily believe. Mm. Um, I'm, I look, I'm sure that there is a subset of the community that have that issue, but is it big enough to say we need to protect everybody from this? I mean, there's always a subset of the community that we can't help. Mm. Um, you know, there's a subset of the homelessness community that we simply can't help because some homeless people are homeless not for choice for say, per se, but because of mental health issues mm. and they don't feel comfortable in a building. Mm. So they like being outside in the open air because that makes them feel happier. Mm. But that's a mental health issue. We can't solve that problem for that person. Or they've got substance abuse, which, you know, we can't solve that problem for that person. So I just wonder why we care so much about the gig economy. As an employer, I don't care if my employees are out there selling their soul to Dodie or whatever it's called mm. at night, as long as they come to work awake and uninjured to be out to be, yeah, to be fit and ready, willing and able to work. I actually don't care. And why should the rest of us? Mm. I'm not saying I don't care so no one else should either, <laughs> but why should we care about this? Well, I suppose why do we care about, about anything? But... Um, I I have some concerns around the, the gig economy and legislating it in a situation where you will inevitably get winners and losers. For those right. for those people that are that are already working it, you're going to get people who if we would make them all employees who you know what, they weren't they weren't exercising their rights as contractors particularly well. Um, such that they could move their work around and it didn't make didn't make a lot of sense for them but now they're going to get a wage and it might just work out really well for them and they kind of just start getting a job um, but there are people and I, I'm almost more sympathetic for, for the latter group which is a situation where being a contractor actually made a lot of sense for them mm. um, they yeah you're right they, they could work as they wished yeah. they had incredibly kind of fluctuating availability they were able to juggle the needs of the the different entities well um they will no longer be able to do that no and i just wonder why we are regulating it um the other thing i read is that the global gig economy is worth 5.4 trillion us dollars around seven trillion mm. australian dollars. australian dollars that is a mad amount of money is are we regulating this because we want some of it do you remember well, the gst issue or, or the you know like gst from overseas purchases we, we want that money so we, mm. we we regulated it we, we well, legislated it i'd be i'd be interested to see well you know certainly if there's any kind of tax accounts out there about mm. whether it's easier to recover gst as opposed to income tax because that's that's going to be the key difference here and especially gst when you've got it's not it's going to be lots and lots of small transactions yeah but surely we pay gst on the gig economy gst would be mm. attached as a goods and service mm. you, get, you pay gst on food not all food but most foods mm. you pay, oh, you're, uh, you're paying gst on on restaurant food mm. i mean I, I certainly don't don't know too much about income taxation law <laughs> chris, but chris is not delving into the gst no, <laughs> the quagmire. No, but i'd be interested to see which ones actually are more kind of beneficial for the government <laughs> and whether because certainly they're not using that as a as a spearhead for any of the uh any of the new legislation yeah look i don't know guys it's you guys so some apparently there's a new 
politically correct term oh, right. of <laughs> you guys versus guys. And I had a rather interesting conversation with my husband about this. I believe that guys is very generic and we should get with the times. We're in 2022 and suck it up, everyone. Mm -hmm. Guys, is, for me, is a very generic term. Mm -hmm. But my husband was of the view that when we say the word guys, we've got it's got a male connotation and guys and girls for instance is, the next, what, is the that is, is the opposite to guys exclusionary of however using you guys apparently is more generic and now a generic term that is socially acceptable to use out there well I'm, uh, and i'm i don't know the case name but i have read this there is an answer to well oh, at sure least an answer in, in discrimination area which is it's well, I don't Sorry see, to the pool, but... <laughs> I don't see, Well, I, I don't see how it could be. I mean, language changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Shakespeare had something to do with that. I call my... When I'm walking my dogs, I say, OK, guys, let's go. Yeah. And I have a male and female dog. I'm not it's, giving them a gender by saying guys. Yeah. Um, it's a collective... It's a collective name. Yeah, come on, guys. It's, let's get it's, moving. It's, it's weird, right? It's a group of people... Anyhow, so I'm I am I am going down a different path hole, a little bit of a rabbit hole there. Yes. Mr. D. Santana, I think that at the end of the day, for me, the gig economy is absolutely here to stay, and I think everyone agrees with that. Mm. I think that trying to regulate it for the wrong reasons is going to be disastrous, mm -hmm. and I think we should get our head around why we want to regulate it and work out whether that's going to be a successful platform to do that. Because if it really is truly the gig economy being online platforms, mm. then people get smarter mm. and mm. the platforms will change. Mm. So I think we should work out exactly what we're trying to solve there. Mm. What have you got for us? Well, I have... In our dying minutes. Yes, I have a, uh, a bit of information. We've been talking, it's probably been in the works for now for sort of 18 months. Um, it's called the Respect at Work Bill. Um, and it was formally put to Parliament uh, this week. And um, I want to get your views on this. There have been... My views or the, 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 our viewers <laughs> and listeners' views? I'm happy to give you a view, Chris. Tell um, me all about it. So there are, there are about 55 recommendations. Um, yeah. But the kind of spearhead of this bill is the idea about having a, a positive duty on employers to ensure that sexual harassment does not occur in your in your workplace, in your employer. In you know your... what? I have said this before, and I will say it again. I do not like just creating laws to make new laws. We have laws that protect people from discrimination. Why aren't we using them? We have vicarious liability. So what are we saying? That it's no longer vicarious liability, it's an actual liability? Surely it's still vicarious. I think... You still, that will still exist, but where I can see this kind of playing potentially productive role is they're also giving the Australian Human Rights Commission a investigative role, which is kind of an interesting thing just generally because we have, uh, and I know that this is going to be subject to... The Australian to, Human Rights Commission, which takes months to assess anything. Absolutely, there's a... There are some serious question marks around whether they are the correct entity to be Funding doing this Funding is work. a real problem. There. Funding is a problem as well as independence because they are also the same commission that would deal with the potential problems. But nevertheless, whether it's them or someone else, yeah. and whether, let's assume they get the funding to do so. Yeah. Um, this idea that they could then go into an organisation and ensure that they are... Um, being more preventative rather than reactive. <sighs> Certainly from my point of view, what's I think this all the, about? I think the devil's in the details, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, what's this mm -hmm. all about? Are we worried that more females are going to be objectified in the workplace or, li or are we worried that um, people are becoming more and more poisonous at work? I mean, or gay people are marginalised, or black people. I mean, what what are we what are we trying to what problem are we trying to solve here? I think I mean, this we are trying is the to, devil detail mm, issue. But what are we trying to solve here? I think we're trying to solve the occurrences of sexual harassment, which we don't find out about. 
So, um, and we. Uh, so this know, is not about respect. This is about sexual harassment. Well, I mean, this particular, this specific kind of issue that we're raising is about seven kind of legislative changes. Of course. Um, but, um, I mean, we all know it goes on where you've got a situation where someone suffers from sexual harassment and they basically just go bugger it i'm just gonna leave yeah but that's not to say that it should have ever happened in no, the first place and we do have something. clients who want to do do something about it for the principle of the thing mm -hmm. and we know in law that the principle of the thing gets pretty thin when you're spending a kajillion dollars yeah and you're not getting any financial or actual benefit from that kajillion dollars mm -hmm. that you've just spent because you know whatever you found a, you yeah. found a job else yeah an altruistic goal it really doesn't get you very far in law look i like the concept that we're going to have more inclusive places with less douchebags, mm -hmm. male and female, in positions where they can lord over or lord it, lord, mm. or lady over mm. um, people. And I'm not being gender specific here because both men and women, as we know, can be jerkwats. Mm. And, and it's also worth noting that, and it's not in front of me now, but it's about 15% of um, male employees have suffered sexual yeah. harassment. Yeah, well, and we've, we've seen that through our work. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Look, <sighs> it's so not going to work. It's not going to work for all the reasons why it doesn't, nothing, the, the current laws that protect people don't work because this sort of thing flows from the top. And, yeah, you might once in a while slam somebody for behaving badly in the workplace and the company might be vicarious li vicariously liable but for the same reason that we have underpayments that are completely endemic in the workplace mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem to be none of the new laws seem to be changing that mm -hmm. it's the fact that the people who are doing it just don't care mm -hmm. they actually actually don't care and we've seen this. We've had employers come to us with really poisonous employees and our recommendation is to get rid of that employee because mm -hmm. they are ruining workplace culture, creating mm -hmm. a very, very difficult workplace in terms of liability. Mm -hmm. And we can't help them. We can't save them from the next bad thing that's going to happen to them because they've allowed this all to happen for too long. And they still do it, even though we give them all this mm -hmm. advice. So... And I'm not saying this everyone, but this starts from the top. If you've got poisonous employees in management, there's someone above them who already knows that they're poisonous and lets them stay. And then the person above them would know that that person is um, sympathetic or puts up with or mm. you know, suitably lets it go. And then we have HR people who say, let's just, just take them out for a coffee and mm. sort it out. Uh, I don't see how this is going. We already have laws that protect. Anyway, I'll get off my little soapbox well, because we actually already have laws that protect people from this sort of thing. Well, I don't mind it, <laughs> but I think you're right where its effectiveness is really going to be dependent on, unfortunately, it's going to be on funding. And there simply will not be a situation where there can be a compliance officer who can go to every single employer in Australia and ask them, where's your sexual harassment policy? Are you adhering to it? Speak to every employee uh, and ask whether there are occurrences of, of sexual harassment in that particular workplace. If that could happen, then great, it would work. But the problem is that that's incredibly onerous. Um, and that being said, I don't think it's, I think it's worth going for because you know what, if it works for however many it can work for, it's not going to solve the issue, of course, but if it works for some, then at least that was something. But using that logic, we'll just make a new law that attacks every single different issue out there. And if it works for one person, brilliant. I mean, how many laws do you want? Yeah, but this, I don't, I don't, I don't agree that this is covering overall ground. Okay, well, let's see what happens. Because um, we should do a uh, we should do another session on this in six months' time. Yeah, when we I have mean, some idea. What ground? What new ground are we talking about here? Um, a situation where um, a company uh, is in contravention of something. I'm not sure what, what they're going to put it as, but in of something for not putting in place steps, not necessarily because something has actually gone wrong. 
So are we putting onerous on even the small and grassroots businesses that have one employee wow. that, do you know, I mean, what, what level, what, where's the cutoff point? Well, they're not proposing a cutoff point. Um, but if it happened, if we're just talking about treading over new ground, that would, in my eyes, certainly be new ground. Mm. Um, and yeah. you'd, you'd assume that that company, after being visited and potentially receiving some sort of contravention notice, changes their way. Yes. Yeah, goes and goes and sees an employee line. And so I don't I'm mind. Assuming too. they get visited. Because because really, at the end of the day, what we've got is an employee that gets harassed or something horrible happens to them and they're left with this concept of they need to get legal advice pay for something that they're now out of no longer having to deal with okay apart from you know whatever ptsd mm. these psychological issues but largely when they quit work the problem goes away and they're left trying to decide whether they want to make a bigger point of this and they don't win at all from that so i just wonder who they're who the litigant will be on this point. Well, I mean, they're still kind of speaking about that, about who is the right entity to be yeah, doing that. Yeah, and but whether or not we can allow people who are not directly involved to be able... Like when we had, like the EPA, for instance, mm -hmm. um, for ages and ages and ages, anybody could do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody with an interest could do it. Now mm -hmm. anyone with a genuine interest, you know. <laughs> they've narrowed it down because it just got silly. Um, yep. Same with the, um, with the work health and safety. Anybody can make a work health and safety complaint. But look, I'm not telling them how to do their jobs, but they probably don't really put a lot of weight on complaints from people who don't know anything about what's happened. Mm. You know, the, well, the photograph, for instance, mm. that someone sends through. I'll give you a good example of where I think it might work well because I think at the early stance, although they might not put a strict cap on it, I think it's going to be going after bigger business rather than smaller ones Yeah. because they probably want the publicity more than anything. But um, we know that mine sites are some of the worst instances for this, not just for sexual harassment, but actual sexual assault. And um, quite often the instances happen and there are reluctant complainers for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, so the... People involved know that this is going on. And when I say people, I mean, there might be a compliance entity. Let's just call mm. them that. Um, because I've certainly have some issues around the Human Rights Commission doing it. Um, and they know there's a problem site. It's allowing them to actually go there and... He gets very interested in this being a female. <laughs> go there and actually... I know this is serious. Kind of put them... Put some... Yeah, look, kind of goggles over what's going on at the site without the need for a person to come forward and and be so, pretty brave to so be like the person. Work safe for that's kind of. But what maybe I think. work safe is the right place for this thing. For well, me. but we we need to get over mm -hmm. our a prejudice about psychological damage in the workplace injuries. It is impossible to get a psychological injury over the line. Not impossible, but you know what I mean. It's difficult. And. Until we take that seriously, we're not going to be able to take this seriously because no one's going to care. Mm. Well, I mean, you've got to start somewhere. Yes, <laughs> I agree. We'll start somewhere. But we already, that, this is what I'm saying, we already have laws. We've already got the Work Health and Safety Act. We've already got... So, yeah, we, we already have the Work Health and Safety organisation that comes in and deals with this sort of thing. Oh, my God! <laughs> um probably not shining today um you know we've got large organizations who have already been looked at for this sort of mm. thing and work health and safety are going in um and the most recent one it, there is no complaint because that complaint is no longer with us mm. i just i would like to see the system investigated better work health if we're going to do this respect mm. at work bill we also need to change our mindset about psychological injury we need to yep. change our mindset about the damage it does to people in terms of work health and safety and mm -hmm. workplace injury mm -hmm. we need to get more psychological injury claims over the line respect at work bill reasonable management action i'm sorry it, it just doesn't seem to make any sense to mm -hmm. me because if you are going through the motions and trying to stop the person from being a being an offender you're performing reasonable management action which gets you over the line it just doesn't seem, none of it seems perfect. Yeah, um, I think there is a strong chance 
that this might be as, as much as I'm in support of it I think there's a really good chance that you can probably get over the hurdle by having a policy which might be stock standard as anything um, and implementing it in a really half-hearted way um, and basically doing the bare minimum which I think for for a large portion of the of society already is happening I, but, I mean it really I mean obviously that's a Devils into details a little yeah. bit about that, but I think that that is a possibility. I'd like to see what we're trying to achieve by this, personally. I, I like the idea of a safer, healthier work environment, especially in some of these office environments where it is very closed door mm. behaviour. Mm. I mean, years ago, um, some Brisbane City Council worker was slammed in a, um, uh, what do you call it, a whistleblowing situation when they were upskirting. And mm. then showing the guy next to them the photos mm. of the upskirting in business meetings. Is that, that's what I heard anyway. Mm. But can we say that's not happening now? I just, you know, we're a decade mm. down the line. We were all appalled by that. Mm. I think that it's an important issue in the workplace, but I think we're dealing with it the wrong way. I think we need to look at it from the top, not just go, we need a policy. But why do we need a policy? Mm. Who at the top is causing this problem and why are they leading the people underneath? We need to make some personal liability. We need to start slamming them, which is probably never going to happen. Probably not. Um, the Work Health and Safety Act slams construction sites all the time for doing this. The individuals that are involved, the guy in the forklift, the, the, the manager who mm. runs to the... Um, oh, you know, like that one in... Um, Ascot, where the giant mm, thing fell mm. on that poor guy who was mm. sitting in there. And one of the workers, one of the owners, was found at the airport with a suitcase full of money. I mean, mm. yeah, we finally slammed one person, but there's been so many more deaths on site. And why, why aren't we dealing with um, suicide in the same way? Why aren't we slamming the employer in that way? Mm because the person can no longer speak and there's nobody there because they are alone to begin with. I should say, if this has brought up anything, there are certainly lots of helplines out there for everyone. But yes, mm. respect to w at work, Bill. Uh, look, I like the concept. I think it's dumb because we've already got laws in place. Let's start using them. Anybody who knows me knows I hate more laws. If we have a law, use mm. a law you've got. Don't just make a new one to create more laws. <laughs> and the mm. Fair Work Day is a good example mm -hmm. of that um but yeah i like the idea i really like the idea i do i do um if i was to put it into kind of one sentence I, uh, my view on it is um i think it does tread a little bit into new ground there's of course going to be some overlap and, and that's to be avoided but whatever yeah um it's good sentiment it can't hurt i don't think it can hurt i just don't think it'll be the it won't fix it no, um, this, is, this is not the magic we wand have, we moment. We have to start somewhere. I, I really think we do have to start somewhere. Um, I don't have an answer right this second, though, but I certainly um, think we ought to start from the top, if uh, nothing else. Unfortunately, um, like with a lot of kind of social change, it just is slow. Yeah. And as much as we, you know, as much as we want things to accelerate, in many ways it actually is a bit of a changing of the tide and the changing of, oh, sorry, changing of the guard. I think yeah. this is generational change. This is not yeah. Uber Eats, it's been around for a decade change. This, this, is, this is literally generational change. And that just takes time. That just takes, and it's not, it's not years, it's decades. Oh, absolutely. When I started in law, um, it was, in, law was an incredibly poisonous environment to be in. And, and in, in many aspects, it still has its serious challenges. Mm. But that's because nobody looked at it. Mm. No one cares about lawyers. No, no. You know, we're office workers who do our thing and whatever happens, it's happening. Mm. And I think there is slowly but surely a, a change, maybe because there are far more females coming into mm. law than there used to be. So there's much more of a balance there in the workplace. But you could be the only female in an entirely male firm. Yeah, it can, it can be quite situational. Yeah. Um, but these days, I think it's a lot harder to only... I mean, I think now there, is, there are some only female firms, which was mm. unheard of a decade mm. ago. I think generational change is, is, is needed here. And, um, 
yeah, more of these campaigns about don't let it go by. Um, mm, I don't mind that. I don't yeah, mind that. anybody who knows me knows that I don't allow even my clients to behave mm. um, inappropriately um, with racist tones, with with um, fascist discussions. Mm. Because if I don't stop it, I'm the only one listening to it. Mm. You know, mm. who else is going to stop it? So mm. I'm very careful about that and do make a little, even now and again, I get hung up on. Yeah. And, you and know, I'm okay with that. And then that's hopefully, is, you know, some of the spirit of what's involved in this. But mm. I mean, that's everything we've yeah, got Yeah, sorry, today. kind of we've went on back. a bit today. <laughs> um, but... Gig um, economy and yeah. respect at work. Yeah. Maybe it goes hand in glove. Maybe the problem with the gig economy there is is that there is no respect while they're working. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> All right, well, we will catch everyone in three weeks' time because yeah. I'm actually on a bit of a holiday. Yeah, so. Chris, Chris is selfishly going on annual leave at a time when, you know, obviously it's terrible. <laughs> um, I always say if it's no good time, no bad time. Yep. It's not a good time, it mustn't be a bad time. Um, yeah, but you're going to have some fun. Yep, I'll be riding my motorbike all the way down to Phillip Island for the next couple of weeks. Zoom, zoom, so zoom. I will be having a lot of fun. Keep an eye out for him if you're watching the, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. Oh, the GP. The like GP, that's right. Which Keep an eye because he might be in the audience having a bit of a wave to us. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll wave to the camera. Freezing your butt ski. Yes, in the coldest part of Australia. Oh, my I God, reckon. Phillip Island. It's very cold. But that wind, it's, anyway, so we'll be back in three weeks. Um... For now, everybody stay safe and see ya. Thanks a lot for watching and listening to the Lawcast. See ya, Ron. <laughs>